at his driving. I knew how good a driver we were. he was, and I had to trust that he was going to be good enough to get us there. But we were getting near to the end of the road, and I knew three bends around, there was this last gravel corner, and on that side, we down to a stream in the farm paddocks, and on this side was a cliff with bush and stuff, and that was fine. And I was thinking, this is a right angle bend. I don't know what's going to happen. And somehow, my trust was not quite at the same level as it had been. Please slow down. Please slow down. You know what's coming up here. There's that sharp bend, and it's right down onto the farmland. Please slow down. Please slow down. Well, we all learned that there's something that we have to trust. And that's something we're going to hear about tonight. We have got drama, we have got dance, and we have got next a chance for you to participate in our congregational song. And so I'd like you to just welcome on the team for the congregational song. Thank you.
few announcements for you uh, this evening. Firstly, um, while I do that, we'd like to take up tithes and offerings. Those of you who are visitors with us tonight, there is no expectation for you to put anything into the bag, but please feel welcome if you want to. While that's being done, I'd just like to uh, pray for the offering. <laughs> Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to give something back to you. Lord, I pray that you'll take it, you'll use it, and you'll bless it. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, a few simple notices. 40 hour famine, 19th of March. If you'd like to see Pat afterwards, Pat's, wave your hand, Pat. Pat's over here on my left. And she will give you the packs that you need to go out and get some sponsorship. Okay, so if you'd like to see Pat after the service, I have in my hand upside down some flyers for the senior services for the month of March. Grab some. If you are a visitor here with us tonight, you're more than welcome. You are very welcome to come back and see some of these other services that we're going to have. On the back side, drama meeting, Monday, 7.30 here. Derek's pushing this very hard. If you are part of the drama team, you need to be here or you need to have seen Derek 7.30, 7 o'clock, what did I say? 7 o'clock, Monday night, whatever, sorry. Okay, so if you're part of the drama team, please be here. Okay, or see Derek and let him know you're not going to be able to make it. Okay, just one more thing. Had a, uh, a note from Adele yesterday. She's missing everybody. She's managed to hurt herself doing the splits. <laughs> so just, just remember Adele, pray for Adele. Okay, she's settling in down there quite nicely, but she misses everybody Sundays and Fridays, especially she says. Okay. Okay, that's me done. After the service tonight, cup of tea. If you'd like to see everybody, if you'd like to stay and chat, you're more than welcome. Thank you. Yeah, it's always, always good to know. 
that I can turn to you in my darkest hour. Hey, that's what friends are for. Yeah. <coughs> so, uh, what's wrong? You know that, that girl I've been seeing lately? Well, no, actually, I haven't had a chance to meet her. But I do recall that you really, really like her. Oh, like her. Oh, it's like that, is it? Yeah. No. Sorry, Will. It's, it's okay. It's not your fault. She left me for another guy. What? What a cow! She left you for another man? She's... She's... She is not even worth worrying about. I know. She's horrible. I can't believe it. She's terrible. I really thought that she was the one. Despicable. And she left me. For another guy. Man, if I ever find who that guy is, I promise I'll... I'll... I'll punch his brains in. <laughs>
and righteousness looks down from heaven. You know, every one of us has perceptions about who we can trust and who's reliable. I was reading the other night, in fact last night, about half past one in the morning, a story about a young family that had broken up. And they said that the children of the family were very, very powerfully affected. And there was one little girl that was close to her dad and had always been so. And dad said, as he left, he says, he says, Annalita, I'll come and see you every Saturday. But he never did. He never came. And Annalita was so badly wounded by that one broken promise that it almost totally destroyed her life. You see, if a dad hadn't have made the promise, it probably wouldn't have had the impact. I remember years ago, when I left the railways, I went to a company and I was interviewed for the job. And one of the things I said to the, to the man interviewing me is that I wanted to specialise more in design of equipment rather than working on machinery. He said to me, 
Oh, we want you in design. We would, you know, we won't, uh, we won't put you on the machines and leave you on the machines. And I said, well, I want to make it quite clear that I'm not prepared to work on the machines. I'm coming here because of the job description you have issued. However, a few months down the track, it so happened that the man who had been working on the machine, making hundreds and hundreds of couplings, became very ill. It was anticipated he'd pro probably be off work at least two weeks. So I said to the company, I, I, was, you know, I was quite happy to help them out and to go and work on the machines for a couple of weeks, just to help them out. I felt secure in the promise that they had given me at the beginning. Unbeknown to me, this guy had only been putting out a limited number of castings every day, and I managed to do a phenomenal number in comparison because of the training I'd had. And I was never allowed off the machine again. And I felt betrayed. I felt as if I had been lied to. I felt as if somebody who had promised me everything had in fact intended to deceive me. Then there's a story of things that we often know. Girl meets guy. Girl falls in love, guy falls in love. Well, he says he does. In fact, he says, I'll always be your closest friend. I'll always love you. Now, in the girl's heart, there's a kind of romantic edge, like there's prone to be in some girls. And she sits there and she sort of swoons in this love that the guy speaks of. She has dreams and images of a life spent with this guy who says he loves her absolutely and he will give anything for her. So she moves a little closer. And she gives a little more. Well, you know the story. You know it oh too well. Before that long, he's not there. And she's receiving payments to help support a little one that's entered the world. He never proved his love. He, he said he loved her, and she was so angry. So very, very angry, and justified himself. Well, what about the other one? situation where a loving family with a loving mother one day suddenly bam a drunken driver hits her head on she's killed and the big single worded questions buzzes in their minds why why is this happening to us why did God allow it God has got to be his fault. You could have kept her alive, they rationalise. You see, when you get down to it, it would appear, it would appear that you can trust no one. That's the way it would appear. And tonight, we're going to look at who we can trust. And who is reliable? The first thing I want to touch on tonight is ourselves. Is that we are fallible. In other words, we fail. We are not perfect. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah? 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 Yes. You're almost there. Yeah! Yeah! Getting it. All right, that's better. You know, promises have been made by great men and great women. And also, they've been made by those who have been almost unseen in society. And every one of us, at some point, has broken those promises. So who can we trust? Who can we rely on? We know we are fallible. We know that we fail. And we rationalise our failure sometimes. 
There's a book that's very well known, and, and it's not a very good book, might I add, by a guy called Fletcher. And it talks about a woman who was imprisoned by the Germans during the war. This woman discovered that there was a way out of prison. She was married, she had family, she had children. She discovered the way out of prison was in this particular prison to be able to sleep with one of the guards. And so she did. But how do you think her husband felt at that kind of betrayal? Fletcher would like us to imagine that he would feel fine because his wife was rescued. I'd like to suggest that she broke her marriage vows. See, we do fail. And we can rationalize it. We can think, if I do this, then this will be all right. There's a common saying amongst our society that there's a difference between black lies, just straight lies, and white lies. White lies are good lies, are they not? Because they're there to help, are they not? But excuse me, let me ask the question. The moment you tell a lie, have you not failed? Have you not failed? Humans will always fail. We are not really that playful sometimes. And therefore we have learned to live with the expectation of failure. So when we approach others, we know that the other person is likely to fail us. That's why the two guys earlier on with Angela. I mean, can you imagine how the other guy felt? And if you think that's not serious, I can tell you how it felt. When my, one of my best friends, Nick Louise off me, he only intended to have a Christmas bit of fun with a girl. In actual fact, the same scenario as what we saw here on stage. He actually didn't realize she was my girlfriend. He heard me talk about her, but he hadn't put two and two together when he arrived in Nelson and met this lovely girl and asked her out. Three days before I was due to arrive in Nelson, they suddenly discovered who she was. Because she happened to mention that uh, there was this guy coming up from Christchurch who she really feels bad about because... Uh, he was coming up to spend Christmas at Nelson so that he could be near her. My friend Wayne said, Doc, what's the guy's name? Oh boy. When I turned up there, I wanted to knock his block off his shoulders. I did. I felt as if my friend had failed me. But in a kind of way, I kind of accepted it. In fact, I still went and painted his parents' house with, with him <coughs> and with her there. The two of them sitting in the corner, holding hands and cuddling. It wasn't very easy. But you see, we have, in a way, designed ourselves, we have, in a way, accommodated ourselves to fail. So we are failures. But what about God? Is he a failure? Or is he really faithful to us? I mean, the, these are kinds of questions that are there. People often point to things like wars and famines and the fact that some relation died or whatever and said, you know, God let me down or God has let the world down. Well, that sounds a pretty good argument, would you not say? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I think it is a good argument. Especially if you're not aware of the reality. You see, it's a pivotal question, because depending on the answer to that question will be the basis on which we draw the conclusion as to whether God is faithful. You see, as C.S. Lewis once said in one of his writings, he says, you know, how do we know that God is in actual fact good by nature? How do we know that he's not a little evil and that our evil side isn't a part of God? How do we know that heaven isn't in fact hell and hell isn't in fact heaven? How do we know? 
C.S. Lewis at the end of it, by the way, draws a conclusion after going through some great length and says, well, we do know because there are certain things that are inconsistent with somebody being good as God has been and then expect him to be evil. I'm not going to develop that tonight. But the question is, did God or has God in fact failed me? One of the sayings we read today says that God never breaks his promises. You know, in the, one of the Psalms that uh, Yvonne read for us, it says that. God never breaks his promises. The question then arises, what did God actually promise? Because if we're going to work on this issue as to whether God is faithful or not, we have to have some measure by which to measure whether he is or not. So I want to propose tonight and ask you a question, is God faithful? Five areas that we need to look at. There's a vast difference between our expectations and what God promised. A huge difference. Let me show you something. I want Pauline to come up here. I want to... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I'll get you to come up here and you can kiss me up here. Oh. <laughs> come up here and kiss me. Come on. You're not kissing me in front of everybody, but you, you told me you married me and love me and all the rest of it. You, but you, you prove your love, you come up here and kiss me. I set it up with you, so I don't know. Got a bite out of you, though. Yeah, that's the kind of thing we do. You see, we sometimes put people in a situation where the expectations that we have are unrealistic. Now, I appealed to the promise she made to me when we got married that she'd be faithful and true, so therefore she should kiss me. But you see, the promise wasn't that she would kiss me in public. In fact, I appreciate some of the kisses I don't get in public. It's probably more enjoyable. <laughs> That's more important. <laughs> We're waiting for <laughs> Our expectations, our expectations are sometimes quite wrong. We, we make assumptions, we draw conclusions that the other party has not drawn. And I think one of our expectations on God is that we expect God to, to flick his fingers every moment we want him to. But he never promised to do that. He never promised once to do that. Uh, I've heard many people who even claim to be Christians who seem to think that if, if they go like this, God's going to do it. Well, if that happened, why did I get my head smashed in last year by a gang? If that happened, why did Pauline and I have conflict when we first got married? If that happened, why did my children be naughty sometimes? In fact, if that happened, why on earth have you all sinned or done wrong? <laughs> Let's get to the point. See, our expectations are sometimes wrong. We expect God to interfere when it's going to save us trouble, but we forget about the trouble that we have caused. Isn't that true? Yeah? 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 yeah. 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 We have close family friends. They're called the Taylors, and some of you may have read about this family. Some years ago in the Congo, their father and husband and the family and the children all their the parents were serving as missionaries. The mother's still alive to this day. She came here a few years ago. And Joy, her husband and her children were taken by some rebels. They were lined up in front of a firing squad. And every one of them was standing there and the lieutenant said, fire! And a hail of bullets hit them. And they all dropped to the ground. The children and the husband. Joy, I don't know what quite happened with Joy, that she wasn't there. I can't remember that part of the story. But what actually, what actually did happen was that the husband was a doctor who'd been working in the Congo helping people. 
who loved God. And, and people said, why? The amazing thing was that as all these adults and these children fell in the midst of bullets, there was a terrified audience, horrified at what they'd seen. The soldiers marched off. The amazing thing in the story was that every one of the children had collapsed to the ground. Not one of them had been touched by a bullet. Now I suggest probably that some of the soldiers didn't like shooting children. And maybe God's hand was in that in some way. I don't know quite how it happened. But one of the daughters of his family has gone through incredible trauma. The others have said, you know, Dad died serving God, but one of the daughters really misses her dad to this day. And she's still asking the question, why? And I believe it's right to ask the question. But sometimes we need to listen to the answer, and maybe the answer isn't the one we expect. And then the second thing I want to touch on, so expectations are different to promises, the second one I want to touch on Much of what happens in this world, God is actually blamed for. But much of what has happened is actually a cause and consequence. You know, something happens and the consequence of that action will affect others. If somebody goes and he gets drunk and drives down the street, he's likely to crash through our fence in front of our <laughs> church here and wreck his car. But if a pedestrian had been walking there, one of us, is it God's fault? Do we apportion blame to God? I think that's unfair. I cannot apportion blame to the brewer because somebody else was foolish enough to get in a car after drinking too much. I cannot blame the person who made the car for the fact that they made the car and therefore killed the person on the corner. I cannot do that. In the same way, in no way can I blame God because somebody with the freedom and independence that God has given and the promise he gave would, would, was that he would give us free choice. Then I can say that God is faithful to his promise. He has given us free, free choice. Well, there's a perspective that goes further than that. And I'll touch on that a little later. There's a verse in the Bible that talks like this. I want to read it to you. It comes from the book of Deuteronomy. It says this. This day I call heaven and earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live, and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to His voice, and hold fast to Him, for the Lord is your life, and He will give you many years in the land He swore to give to your fathers. Choose life, He said. But He was talking about much more than we often perceive. Then the third area I want to touch on tonight is when we face what appears to be an absence of meaning. We hit some kind of major trauma. Let's, uh, let's ask a couple of people who'd like to be volunteers to receive uh, some chocolate. Two people. I'd love one of the uh, deaf people to come. And I'd love somebody else who'd love the first person up here can have one. Come on, you're slow, you lot. Okay, who else is coming? Come on, Douglas. Tell it. Come on, you. Now, don't need to see. Don't need to see this. Come on, here. Here's one inch. I got this on the aircraft. On each one. I'd like you to unwrap it. It says Merry Christmas on it. 
money. And instead of trying to sit down and trying to trust God and trying to accept maybe there's something happening here that's a little different, I got angry. And I remember that situation. I'm embarrassed to say a little bit, but I felt I ought to tell the story. I got really angry. And Pauline says, don't worry about it. Now, normally with money, that's not Pauline's comment. But I got angry. And I said, all right for you. You don't know how much money I spent on the car. And my voice was probably less that loud. And I got quite upset. I got quite wound up. And I couldn't see there could be another perspective happening here. At that moment, I could only see I had a bill and the postman had been and the money wasn't there. Very logical conclusion. I'm a rationalist. Something very irrational happened that day. The postman came back later on. And guess what? The money was there. But what? Suppose it had taken two weeks for it to arrive. Really, how much difference would it have made? And yet I got so stupidly upset. So stupidly upset. So sometimes we cannot see the meaning of what's happening. We don't understand the situation. We don't understand our circumstances. And we make assumptions. Or we already have preset assumptions or preset paradigms, ways of thinking which says this should happen and that should happen and this should happen and if it doesn't happen, God's to blame. If it hadn't turned up, there might have been another conclusion. Say the money hadn't turned up. What would be the conclusion I might need to draw? Maybe God didn't want me to repair my 1958 Effie Holden called Baby Faye. It was already named that when we got it. That could be a conclusion. It could be that I didn't understand what I was meant to be doing and that I got it wrong. <coughs> but that's okay. Then the next one that we don't always understand is that challenges shape and mould us. Challenges do. When I asked Marilyn and Douglas to come up for the chocolate before, if they were children, do you know what I imagine? I can imagine Marilyn standing there as a little girl and going, She might have gone up and Doug's gone, Poof, give me that chocolate! I got a bump for me, oh, okay. You know, all of us, when we're children, had quite different reactions. But she has changed. You see, she quite maturely stood there. Looked very disappointed in me. Felt like kicking me hard. Gave me a nudge instead. And thought, I'll get you later. Is that right? Pretty close. <laughs> You see, you see, the thing is, and her mouth was watering for the chocolate, she says. She was hanging out for it. You see, sometimes the challenges that we face, they mould us and shape us in ways that are good for us. Some of the hidings I got from my friends at school didn't appear to have any good consequence at the time, but I can tell you what, getting hidings aren't a problem. Some of the violence I faced in other situations left me with a strength of character that when I became a Christian and learnt the reality of what it was to be a person who could stand up under tough times, it had moulded me and shaped me even though I felt extremely damaged at times. It had moulded me and shaped me enough to be able to say, I can stand here, I can stand on this ground because I know that God is on my side in spite of what man might do. So challenges do shape us and the way that we respond to those difficult times will shape us well. It was said recently when there was a report done on America 
about the children that are growing up in their world today, and I suspect it's a little bit similar in New Zealand, although there hasn't been a report that I know I've done in this way. It was said that the children in America have been given far too much, far too easily, and they are weak, and they give in easily. They do not rise to the challenge in a way that their forebears did. Well, I'm not surprised. Their forebears fought off Indians, fought off bears, you know. They had to survive in a land that was tough and arid and rough. And it made them a nation of strong people. And we've got to acknowledge they are. The ones who are around our age and older, many of them are very strong people. Life is a challenge here. How do we do it? And then I want to uh, come to the fifth one in relation to life's perspective. When we view life in a short term perspective, we will readily become confused. If we're looking at the life just until I die, then things like cancer or HIV, AIDS, or other things like tsunamis or earthquakes or whatever, they can terrify us. That's not to say that those who have a different perspective and a better perspective don't have a little bit of fear. But I believe that if we are people that really do get a good perspective on life, it can change our whole way we approach difficult situations. Dr. Campolo, Tony Campolo, tells a story of a little boy. And this little lad, young guy, he was, uh, he was in his teenage years, but he was only small, small stature. You see, he had suffered as a child from cerebral palsy. And what happened in that camp disturbed Tony Campolo as he spoke at this camp. He was the guest speaker there. It was a large camp. And he saw other children teasing this boy, and they were going, gig, 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 and mimicking his inability to speak. And when they walked past him, that moved like he moved. And this young guy, Tony Campolo, said he stood there and he felt the pain that that young guy must be having. Well, the end of this camp came, and the end of the camps that they have over there, they have this thing they call a testimony night, where people get up and say what the camp did for them in their lives. And Tony Campolo said several of the young handsome boys and young handsome girls got up and told these stories about what Jesus did for them, and he said it just felt empty. He said it was just useless words that meant nothing. They just wanted to look big in front of other people. He said, but a stillness suddenly came over the crowd as this young guy, Gabriel, came down the aisle, struggled to the front, into the front of the microphone, and he said this. He said,
Gabriel had a perspective on life that was eternal. He lived with physical disabilities, which meant it impaired his speech, it impaired his ability to move, and impaired him in all sorts of ways. He couldn't play, he couldn't catch ball, he couldn't do anything. But his life perspective was an eternity, not on the life we live today. And in the scripture that we have tonight from the Psalms, it says, Love and faithfulness meet together. Righteousness and peace kiss each other. Faithfulness springs forth from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. And what it's really saying is that when God's a loving God and He is a loving God, then He's always going to be faithful. He's always going to want what is right. I'd like a lady to come up here because I would like to do something to them. <laughs> Who would like to come? Nobody. I suspect that when I produce it, you might not. And you don't know your dark secrets. Because you only need to look to know that some of you have used them. You're very fortunate, in fact, if you come, you're quite safe because it doesn't go. You see, your anticipation was wrong. And maybe, maybe, sometimes the things you've anticipated is that God would not be faithful is wrong. Because He is faithful. And I know it. There was a guy called Gideon years ago. He used to put a fleece out. When he wanted to know whether God was on his side, one night he put it out. He said, I want the Jew all round, but not on the fleece. Another night he says, I want the fleece wet with Jew, but not all round. And God heard his prayer. A lot of people trick God like that, but I don't think Gideon kept doing that all his life. In fact, I know he did. You see, we sometimes think we can fleece God. But God is faithful. And He's true and He's righteous. And, and when it says love and faithfulness meet together, that's, that's the truth. God really loves you. And if He really loves you, then He's really faithful to you. The two go hand in hand. You see, the thing is that God, in spite of everything that some people might say, He is present and He is involved in the lives that we face. When He sees death, or even sometimes on a leave of, leave of absence, we need to stop and we need to say, God, what are you saying here? Because I know you're faithful. We need not be angry in any way. Because if we express our anger to God, sometimes all we do is mess ourselves up. God's okay with anger as long as it's justified. What He would rather we did was to take ourselves and we come with Him with a confidence and say, God, I'm going to give you my best shot. Oh, you prove yourself. You prove your faithfulness to me. Because it doesn't matter whether we claim to be Christians or not, life still has that potential to be explosive. And, and, and we will hit moments. We might feel secure today or tomorrow. But one day there's something that's going to happen that will devastate us if we haven't got a perspective which knows that God is a faithful God. You see, if we sit there feeling as if we've got God all figured out and we know better, we are in grave trouble. Grave that leads to hell. Not death that leads to life. Now I'd invite you tonight to really seek to discover, I don't care whether you claim to be a Christian or not, to seek to discover how real God can be and how faithful and how reliable He can be for each one of us here. Because He is. 
sometimes we can go through what Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King, but one of his earlier forebears he was named after. Martin Luther. He went through this thing he called the dark night of the soul. It was a tough and a rough time. And at times he even doubted God. And he was a tremendously strong man of God at the time. He didn't see it that way sometimes. But he came out the other end and he said, God is faithful. And I know this too. If you'd like to join me in a prayer, we're going to talk to God now. I'd like to invite you to do so. And if you really feel that maybe God's worth giving a shot, that maybe He is more reliable than you've expected before, then I'd like you to join me in this prayer. At the end, when I say all the people say, Amen, is the response that you can give. I don't say Amen to my own prayers, because it simply means I agree. I think it sounds a bit silly to just pray a prayer and then say I agree. <laughs> so, that's what I'm going to do. So if you'd like to join me, you can either close your eyes, open your eyes, whatever. But we're going to talk to God. I'm going to close mine just so that it gives you some space and privacy. God, sometimes we haven't given you enough credit for the fact that you are faithful. Sometimes we've gotten a little angry and we wanted to blame somebody and Yes, you've got broad enough shoulders to be able to accept it and to help us to see better. God, we're sorry for the times when we have had a wrong perspective. When we have raced ahead and made accusations that have been unfair against you and maybe even sometimes other people. We're sorry for the fact that our expectations have sometimes been unrealistic and have not been the kinds of things we should have expected. Sometimes we have done wrong, we have sinned, we have, we have not done ourselves a service and the consequences have been sown in our families and our own lives and sometimes we've suffered because of it and we've not wanted to take responsibility and tonight we want to say, Lord, we are sorry and we want you to, to become our leader in our lives. We ask you to help us to keep a good perspective which will mean we'll have a balanced life. Lord, we know that you haven't promised to keep us away from suffering or anything like that, you, but you have promised to be with us in the midst of it as you suffer for us. So we ask that you will forgive us, and that you will guide us, and we ask that you'll help us to understand how faithful you really are. In Jesus' mighty name. And all the people said, Amen. And all the people said, Amen. Good response. The Lord bless you. Let's show appreciation to the team, Manu, and all those guys. Thank you.